These are the planes that won wars. Proud veterans of the days when heroes fought in the skies. You don't fly it, you actually strap it on and then you are one with the aeroplane. In hangars and workshops across Britain, engineers and enthusiasts are fighting a desperate duel against corrosion. It's only glued on, I'm sure it'll be all right. And the clock. I'll be pretty gutted if we don't make it. Their mission, to return historic military aircraft to the skies. The hardest thing is finding the parts. From Falklands vets to Cold War jets. As a little lad, you go, mum, 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 can I have an Airfix kit? Now it's time to play, isn't it? But it can be an unpredictable business. We fueled it up and all those seals decided to let go a bit. We need a plan B. I'm not sure we've got one. And dangerous. It can turn nasty quickly. Contact. You're taking off thinking if the engine stops, where are you going to land? I mean, I've had three engine failures. It takes serious money. You need a cool three to six million pounds to get a good spare part. And total dedication. Minus 28. Some of the tools are freezing up. 15 minutes of holding a screwdriver. You can't feel your fingers. This time on Warbird Workshop, a small plane with big problems. We took the fabric off the wings and they literally fell apart. And the German pilot determined to save the unique American Warbird that could have killed him. A wing breaks and you go down, no walking away from that, no. It's a mammoth project for a father and son team used to big challenges. It's going to be very, very close. Yeah, right, the whole wing can come in now. Whoa! Portsmouth, home to the Royal Navy and the port that helped win the war. Today, its battleships have been scrapped and the fleet is a fifth of its size in 1945. But one war veteran is about to return to duty. Unfortunately, this one had an accident in Calais in France and ended up on its back. The Aeronca Defender has a claim to being one of America's least known warbirds. But this one was German pilot Alex Kutz's pride and joy. I turned into the taxiway and then a uh, wind gust uh, just span around my plane and unfortunately there was a train. The left wheel got stuck and the wind f just flipped over the airplane. We recovered it, brought it back and have been repairing it ever since. What started off as quite a simple repair for us <laughs> has morphed into quite a big overhaul. Engineer Mark Masters and his son James have a mission. How many of these do you want for that other railer on? To get the Defender back in the air by 2020, the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. Good, start spraying it this afternoon then. Mark will be passing on 30 years of expertise to his apprentice. He never does what he's told, what son does. They always know best, but eventually he sees my way and we get there in the end. He's never let me down. He questions a lot of things I do, because I know I'm right most of the time. Me and Dad have a really good connection. With the help of assistant Chris. Invited him along one day to just give us a hand and it's grown from there. Yeah, we couldn't be without him now. Alex chose Mark because he'd helped restore another of his planes. He's passionate, he's been understanding, and he's just a thoroughly nice chap. It's December 2018, and after years of painstaking work, Mark is beginning the final and most crucial stage of the restoration. The wings and tailplane have already been rebuilt. Now, he's completing the aircraft's wood and fabric control surfaces. So this is the rudder off the little Aronka Defender. This has been covered in fabric, it's been rib stitched, and then we've had all these tapes applied. It's had the first coat of what we call rounder proof. It's been a bigger job than anyone expected. We took the fabric off the wings. The wings were all made of wood and they literally fell apart when we took the fabric off. So we had to completely remake both wings, new ribs, everything. They had total glue failure. That hidden problem could have caused a serious structural failure. Super, I see only things out. Owner Alex Cutts is an orthodontist whose private passion is flying and old planes. 
including those which fought in World War II. Mark was happy that I'm still alive was because he showed me the, the woodwork and, and the wood was rotten all over and, and the wing ribs were just kind of paper which ripped in your fingers and it's hard to say but uh, it was good luck. Well, the nightmare scenario would be that uh, you fly and a wing breaks and, and you go down and that's it. Chris, if you pull that through about three foot, I should be able to feel it. Go on. Mark has replaced hundreds of components in the Defender. While the dope on the wings and tailplane dries, he's finishing work on the fuselage. Go on. You want it all the way in? Yeah. We've got a bit of interior work to do. We've got the brakes to set up, they're cable-operated brakes. The engine was just completely shot all out of limits, so we've had to source another engine for the aircraft. Some defenders braved enemy gunfire during the Allied invasion of Europe. But a natural phenomenon that choked its tiny engine with little warning was almost as great a threat to its pilots. We're connecting up the carb heat. The purpose of the carb retta heat is that these carbs are very simple Venturi carb retta, and you can get ice forming inside in the right conditions. So we have this box on here. This is where the air would normally come in through a filter, but the box allows us via a control in the cockpit to close a shutter inside. And that will then allow the air to come from a shroud around the exhaust, which takes warm air through the carb retta and would melt any ice. Ex-soldier Chris came to the workshop to learn on the job. I've only been doing this uh, three, four years. It started off as a kind of hobby, a passion. You learn this by someone with skills like Mark, who teaches you. And Mark's been doing this kind of thing for 30 years. There's not many people out there who still do this kind of work. So uh, I suppose it's a bit like the old school uh, apprenticeship. He uh, starts off showing me very basic things and you just progress, you know, doing, doing fabric work and rib stitching is quite an art. So I, as a kid, was a plane spotter, always built airfix models. I left school, did an apprenticeship at the old airfield at Hamble. Back early 90s, started up on my own and worked on Jungmann, Stomps, Pipers. We've done a few overseas jobs, generally survived and we're still going strong. I fly as well, so working on them gives me a better understanding for when I fly and flying on them gives me a better understanding for when I work on them. So you know how important things are. It's February and apprentice James has been called away for a week to work on another plane. So Mark has drafted in a young pilot with a passion for engineering to help out. Andy has flown in from the Isle of Wight. Left the airfield at 10 to 9, got airborne and uh, headed over, beautiful commute, and walked over the road and uh, started working on the lovely old aircraft. Life is bliss. Owning a rare warbird requires dedication and often deep pockets. For a young engineer, the chance to work on one remains a privilege. It's the character of them, beautifully built, some of them, really nicely built. Being able to touch it, you know, all that history behind it. It's not just some spam cam flying around teaching students. It's going to go on for years and years. But the team are about to discover that restoring a warbird is rarely easy. Next, they must attach the newly rebuilt wings to the fuselage for the first time. You always get to this stage and think we're nearly there, and then you realise that actually you're probably about halfway there. In this hangar at Leon Solent near Portsmouth, the restoration of a rare Eronka Defender is about to take a major step forward. So my heart is thumping a little bit at the moment. <laughs> right, ready? Right, we'll get the struts. For Mark, it's a big day. The struts which support the wings were damaged beyond repair in the accident and are no longer available. So they've been manufactured from scratch. We need the bullet bolts and some screwdrivers, which I'll get. 
because they were a lot of work and an awful lot of money. So we're going to lift it, put it on the attachment points, yep. just slop a screwdriver through for now. If you need a brake, just shout. There's no guarantee the struts or the wings will fit. They must precisely align several holes all at once. Right, just come towards the aeroplane with the back. Yeah, go on. Go on. It's near in. Well, that went almost too well. The wings go on smoothly but they are supported by the brand new struts. Tube has been imported from America and custom welded to precise plans. So we're gonna see if we can get this on now. So this is a jury strut. This just, this just braces the struts in flight. It stops them, just gives them a bit of rigidity. Um, right. The main load struts fit perfectly, but one of the supporting jury struts doesn't. I think all it is is this weld yeah. here is probably built up a bit more than the original and it's stopping the strut from going down. It's just hitting that weld. Not by much. But I can see I can see the hole when, when it goes up. The strut will have to be modified by the metal worker who made it. I'm gonna run a reamer through that. It's just tight coming out the other side of the bracket. And the team hoped they were on the last lap of the rebuild. Well, the next thing is to put all the stars and bars on the wings. There's some stenciling to go on the fuselage. I've just got the cowlings to paint and fit. This boot cowl goes on there. And then the windscreen, we've got a new windscreen for it. That's got to be fitted. With summer approaching, their customer is keen to get his hands on his newly refurbished Defender. But this warbird is putting up a fight. You always get to this stage and think we're nearly there, and then you realise that actually you're probably about halfway there. In Germany, Alex is keeping up his flying skills at a gliding club near his home in the foothills of the Alps. Now we are at the southern part of Germany, and uh, we have a perfect gliding spot right here. Of course, we have a lot of local thermals around here, around the airfield, so it's a pleasure for gliding. You can go to Switzerland, you can go to Austria, you can go to uh, Bavaria, just over the Alps and then you're in Italy. It takes you about one and a half hours. It's a very good place to be here. What's uh, flying mean to you? <laughs> well, it's number two after my family everything for me in my life, in my spare time and uh, I have great friends around here, good community and uh, yeah, that makes sense for me. You always have to be aware of the risks and there are a lot of risks in the Alps. You have to know the scenery and then you have to know where to fly to, to get the lift and you, you, do, you have to know what uh, places to avoid because um, some kind of valley winds that just drop you down and you have to stay away from the mountains. The rewards are great. The scenery, the, the mountains and uh, with those fields of snow still remaining even in the summer and, and uh, the glaciers. These skies were once the home of Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe, whose formidable pilots, flying fighters like the Messerschmitt 109, took a terrible toll on Allied airmen during the war. Today, in the UK, the planes they once flew are kept flying by a growing band of enthusiasts. But Germany's relationship with planes of the Nazi era is still uneasy. The markings are absolutely forbidden in Germany. Even when you fly models, you're forbidden to do any kind of swastika on the tail feathers. On the other hand, I think it's good to preserve uh, the airworthiness of a handful of planes. 
which still exist and, and are still uh, airworthy, just in order to present it to our ancestors. Our generation had nothing to do with our former generation, so I think we should remember the things that happened, what we don't have to emphasize always. Uh, well, uh, there is a special guilt on the Germans because of the happening through the war, and war is always wrong. And if you look to the world today, I think it's quite, quite smart to sit on the table like we do and talk to each other. Back in Hampshire, Mark is putting the Defender back into uniform. Every inch of her fabric has been replaced and repainted with ten coats of dope and paint. So we're just masking up to put the insignia on the wings, so as the stars and bars on the wings, the same as the side of the fuselage. So we've stenciled the, the shape out. We've taped it up with the blue tape you can see, which is a fine line tape. That gives us a nice crisp edge to the paint. If you were to use masking tape, when you take the tape off, the edge will be all frayed. Because the fabric flexes, you need a paint which, which will flex. If you use a, like a standard two-pack car paint and you don't have any flex agent or, or a plasticizer in the paint, what tends to happen is it goes very brittle and hard. And as the fabric flexes, the paint will crack. Through scaling up wartime photographs, Mark has produced accurate templates. But it seems every Defender was unique. If you actually look at loads of images of Defenders, everything's different. You know, there, there doesn't seem to be a set way of doing it. I'm sure in wartime operation, if someone was tasked with painting the aircraft in the field, the markings would, would go on where they went on. The art of producing the perfect paint job requires preparation and concentration. When I put the fine line on, I'm forever looking down. I'm, I'm just making sure there's no flats on the radiuses. We want to make sure we've got nice straight lines all the way through, everything is square. And uh, you know, it, to me, uh, it, it's worth spending the time because when you finish and take the tape off, it, it's going to look right. There are no shortcuts. Even the wing markings will take days of work. The first coat is just a, a key coat, so I just put a light, very light coat on and um, then let that flash off and then I'll put a slightly fuller coat on. We'll see how that looks. I tend to do it by eye, but I would imagine there'd be three or four coats of white and then I need to put the red on, so that would be probably a two or three coats of red, and then I need to mask the blue up as well. So again, another couple of coats of blue. He's skilled, very skilled. You put a certain colour on top of another colour, it might bleed through, so you've got to work all that out first. During the war, they always use the mat because obviously it's not reflective. I'm very passionate. I, I get a lot of pride out of my work. I get a lot of pride out of doing the job correctly and you know, and I get a lot of pride of seeing the aeroplanes 20 or 30 years later and they still look as good as the day we did it. As Mark's reputation has grown, the spare space in his hangar has shrunk. New customers are always welcome, but there's a queue. We're pretty stacked at the moment, so this is a Bell 47 helicopter. It's very similar to the helicopter we all know from MASH. And then we move on to a Booker Youngman, which is another project. And this one is one of the Spanish-built ones. Uh, what else have we got? So this is an Aronca Chief. And this is a side-by-side -side civilian aircraft, although, again, some of these were used in the military. So this is a, a, a Curtis Robin, 1928. I mean, it's incredible that, you know, just sort of 15 years from when the Wright brothers first flew there, powered glider, you know, they were coming up with things like this. Mark's next deadline, however, is looming. The cosmetic restoration of this jet, once capable of speeds of over 700 miles per hour. So this is a Hawker Hunter. This is a bit of a departure for us. 
It's obviously a, a non-airworthy aircraft, but we were approached by a, a local businessman who had purchased the aircraft. His father actually flew Hawker Hunters for the Iraqi Air Force in the 60s. The British aircraft industry is making a new push in the face of declining foreign sales. When it first flew, the Hunter was one of the fastest planes in the sky. And at Fondra, they put on a spanking display of new craft, like the Hunter Mark 12. Its owner has a special reason to restore this jet. He wanted to do something to pay homage to his father, so he's bought the aircraft. And as you can see, we've completely stripped it. We're doing some repairs, and then it's going to go outside the guy's business. Mark now has two deadlines approaching. He needs to transport the Hunter jet over 45 miles and then raise it onto a plinth and reattach the wings. You just have to think about what you're doing, take your time, and uh, it's fine. But yeah, it is bloody nerve-wracking as well. And the team must reassemble the Defender, ready for a test flight. The problem is, why is you come from and learn for the next project, really? It's June 2019, just six months to the 75th anniversary of the year the war ended. Today, the Defender will be assembled ready for its first test flight. For this, Mark's team will need hangar space with runway access. Today we're taking it over to Britain Norman, who are just on the airfield. It's literally a three minute drive up the road. I mean, we could almost push the aeroplane there. Britain Norman have manufactured the Islander aircraft for over 50 years. And fortunately, they have a spare corner in their new hangar. So the hangar allows us to assemble the aircraft and gives us direct access to the airfield, um, which obviously for test flying is, is something we need. Every component has now been fixed, fabricated or found. By the end of the day, the aim is to have a complete aircraft. We found delaminate and plywood we found ribs that had suffered glue failure, so all that's been done now. So the wings are pretty much like brand new wings now. All the steel work, um, all the corrosion that we found in the airframe has all been done and treated. So it's pretty much a new aeroplane. But when working with vintage planes, things rarely go according to plan. This project has taught James to improvise. The problem is, why is you come from and learn for the next project, really? But there's one area where James still admits Dad knows best. I leave the spraying to, to the boss because he's, he's the best at it. <laughs> Especially this um, matte colour. It's quite hard to apply. The years haven't been kind to the Defender. Virtually no component has been left untouched. Originally, the rudder just it didn't fit very well at all. So we've had to take all the hinge points off and redo them and it actually fits quite well now. It's time to attach the wings and their supporting struts. The issues with the jury strut have now been resolved. Come in at the front, Chris. Replace all the hardware. I mean, potentially, some of the hardware that had been on there, I mean, you, you take it out, the, the CAD plating's gone, there, there's corrosion. So it's just not worth it. I mean, you're, you're putting the aeroplane together now, potentially for another 20, 25 years. Come around a little bit to me. Down, 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 down. Stop. The newly modified jury struts slide on with gentle persuasion. Ready, Chris? This one was a bit more of a wiggle. Oh, that's going. Every detail must be checked and double checked. Other way. Yeah. Yeah. Probably taking about a thousand hours. Down. There we go. It's just nice to see the end of it now. You just tap it through that way. Alex can now know he's got an aeroplane which is structurally safe and sound. 
We had a little bit of jiggery pokery, but everything's on. There's no undue strain that concerns me. It's been a good day. It's pretty much there. Now assembly is complete, the airworthiness of the Defender must be assessed by the Light Aircraft Association, which helps police aviation safety in the UK. We have to calculate with a pilot and fuel where the centre of gravity will fall. After that, it really becomes engine runs and a paperwork issue. Mark is happy his job is done. It's time to start looking for a pilot to carry out a test flight. Germany, Alex is hard at work. His successful dental business has bankrolled the restoration, but it's been a painful process, plagued by unpleasant surprises. Orthodontics is like restoring uh, an old aeroplane because you just want to do it once in a lifetime and then just keep it alive and go to maintenance. He's been keeping in touch with progress in the UK throughout. Yeah. Hi Mark, how are you doing? So, uh, what do you think, When, uh, at what time can I come and, and get it? It's the paperwork, so I'm hoping, you know, by the end of, well, mid-July, mid all the paperwork will be in. Okay. And then it's really down to, down to the LAA. And the struts are okay right now? <laughs> yeah, they're all good. We had to adjust one of the jewellery struts. Okay. Um, but they absolutely fall on. I'm so pleased with them. Alex is such a fan of the Air Onca company, he now owns two of their planes. Mark helped restore this one in England. Just have a look at it. Uh, you have to, to yeah, it's, it's nothing to compare. You just have to look at it and, and say, wow. Air Onca designs were aimed at the man in the street and thousands bought into the dream of a Cadillac in the sky. That's a great craftsmanship and then this great paint job and, and, and every nut and bolt is restored in the correct way. That's terrific. The accident became an opportunity to transform the Defender and he was happy to wait for Mark to do the job. He's such a lovely guy and, and he's doing such a good work so I told him just go ahead and let me know when you're ready. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> but in the UK, Mark is still waiting for the Defender's vital paperwork. And his team are racing to meet another deadline. Back in, going to hit the, right, the well, back of the well, we'll just we turn it around then. The Hunter jet has been given a fresh coat of paint and is ready for its new home in Basingstoke. We're just going to put the fuselage on the trailer first and then the wings will lift out of the wing stands go on to the high-up lorry and a the trailer, and then we're going to take it up to the customer's premises. It's going to be stressful. <laughs> um, got to be really careful, obviously, because of uh, fresh paintwork. Where strops go, where we lift it from, it's all going to be precise. Yeah, Mark has enlisted the help of a specialist local company he's used before. It is a bit nerve-wracking. We put so much effort and, and hours and time into the job. Um, obviously, you don't want anything to happen now. Some areas of the fuselage are thick metal plate. Others would be instantly crushed by the jet's weight. Only Mark fully understands the jet's internal structure. Right, just stop. Can we go up? Wayne, we can't put it there. You just have to work through it and, and think about what you're doing. Take your time, and uh, it's fine. But yeah, it is bloody nerve-wracking as well. Eventually, the fuselage is safely secured. Mark's thoughts now move to the destination. I think for me, it's just the lift when the aeroplane's suspended in the air, and obviously, open. no one's going to do any damage to it on the way up. It's quite a wide load. But other than that, I'm... I'm reasonably confident. The Hunter jet winds its way to its new home in Basingstoke. When it arrives, Mark's team will need to raise it onto a plinth and reattach the wings. 
went way, way miles too high on the back. With the Defender reassembled, it's time for the test flight. And there's a problem. Oh, oil. Oil pressure. In the hangar at Leon Solent, the Aeronca Defender is ready for takeoff. But until a vital survey by the Light Aircraft Association is done, it's not going anywhere. And today, engineer Mark Master's mind is elsewhere. It's early evening, and in Hampshire he is nervously awaiting the delivery of a Hunter jet. Everything's arrived in one piece, no issues and uh, we're just going to start unloading the wings and then we'll do the fuselage, so all, all's good so far. As a new day begins in Basingstoke, work gets underway. The pressure's on. They only have the crane for one day. Just uh, grease up these sleeves. James, can you just grab hold of that, please? Come on, up you go. Up. Yeah, down. Down. Everything lines up perfectly. Right, can you pass us the bolts up? Yeah? Yeah, go on. It was a bit squeaky bum time with it hanging off the crane, but it's slotted in the plinth perfectly and uh, really happy. So, so you're set for the top. Now the job everyone has been dreading. It's time to attach the wings, and someone needs to climb on top of the smooth, damp fuselage. I'm happy to do it, but I didn't see anyone else jump into it, and I'm the lightest, so... <laughs> it's going to be very, very close. Um, so we're, we're trying to get the angle of the crane, of the strops, to get the angle of the wing. So it's going to take a little time, a little fine-tuning, but we'll get there. What I want you to do, Al, is try and line it up laterally. Yeah, well, hold it there. Hold it. We've got to go up at the front of the wing on that chain. So we're way, way miles too high on the back. So it's got to come back. Yeah, right, the whole wing can come in now. But after hours of head scratching... There we go, there we go. Go on, that's it. You got it, you got it. It's bolted into place and the team can move on to the other wing. This is pretty good, actually. The second wing is fitted in under an hour. Yeah, it's going. There she goes. That's... All right, relax. All good. The second one went straight on. For Mark, the job is done. An historic warbird back in military colours and ready for inspection. I hope it's everything he, he hoped it would be. I think it looks fantastic. For businessman Rafi Razak, it's a landmark tribute to his father, Abdul. My father would be very, very proud in what I have done. It's a combination of remembering my father's history as well as the great British engineering to produce such a plane. October 2019, when the paperwork has arrived, it's time to test fly the Defender. A little anxious, of course, because, you know, it's just human nature. But um, no, I, I would say I'm nervous. Obviously, we're confident of what we've done. I think it looks brilliant, and as soon as we see it up in the air, it'll be a nice feeling. So, fingers crossed. Mark has recruited Rich Valor, a veteran pilot with experience in similar aircraft. The first thing I'll be looking for is to uh, just make sure that all the controls are working as you would expect and the responses of the aircraft to those control inputs are what you'd expect. I will probably then just sort of disappear out to the north just for a little bit and try to do an impressive landing because no matter how good the flight is, everybody judges it on the landing. The engine has been run successfully several times today, but this will be its first flight. Mark has done an excellent job of restoring it. Primed and locked. Throttle set. Contact. But before it even begins, it seems the test flight is over. Oh, oil. Oil pressure. 
Despite meticulous preparations, there are gremlins in the system, and the test is cut short. I'm not going to run it with no oil pressure, Mark. What the hell? That was up huh. to 35 straight away. Last Nothing. Time. Fortunately, Mark quickly diagnoses a faulty gauge, and he has a replacement. Throttle set. Contact. Right. Oil pressure is looking good. Temperature is starting to rise. Altimeter is set to zero, which is uh, airfield height. With all the dials looking good and a favorable forecast, Rich is happy. It's time to get the Defender in the air. Left aileron is up, right is down. Right aileron is up and left is down. And everything is wiggling and waggling with nothing preventing any form free movement. Feet off the brakes, lined up with the runway. After a recent accident, this is now the only airworthy defender in the country. And we're climbing out at 75 miles an hour, 70 and 80 miles an hour. And we're at 1,000 feet. Following the noise of maintenance circuit over the green areas. The defender will need to be mechanically perfect to make the flight back to Germany. A series of rigorous checks are carried out. Performance and handling are monitored constantly. 900 feet. To complete the test, Rich only needs to make a safe landing. And we're final to land this time, and uh, we're coming 250 feet. It's crosswind from the left. Um, speed is a little bit high, 65. Rich must make his approach over open water and the busy beachfront of the south coast. And we're down and getting ready to vacate the runway to the left. As the defender tacks it in, Mark sends photos over to Alex in Germany. Yeah, that's gone. So he's probably <laughs> deep inside someone's root canal at the minute. Mark knows that everything looked good from the ground, but Rich will be the one deciding if the defender is fit to fly on. What do you reckon? It flies nicely. Oh, that's good. I'm really pleased. Well done, Rich. The landing wasn't brilliant, but um, it, it looks all right from three miles away. Good. <laughs> So do I. <laughs> With the all clear from Rich, it's another finished restoration. We've put a lot of effort into that, but I've got to be honest, and I'm sure anyone that does a project like this will say, you know, you're ready for it to fly and disappear and start the next one. It's time for Alex to book his flights to pick up his warbird. It's December and the Defender is about to be reunited with its owner. This is actually the first time I've ever been involved with the owners coming in and seeing the plane for the first time, so it'll be a new one for me to... Obviously, when you're working, you think things can be better, but once you finally get there and uh, you stand back and look at the finished product, it's, it's, I think it looks really good. Alex has flown in from Germany. Today we are at Goodwood, and it's the first time I will see my aeroplane I'm very nervous to see it after the, such a long time, and I think I'll take a ride with uh, Richard. Oh, oh. <laughs> damn! I won't fly her. <laughs> I keep her like that, and ooh, wow! It, 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 it smells the same. Yeah. Great. Unbelievable. 
unbelievable. The long restoration has turned Alex from a customer into a friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Wow. I want to look like that when I'm 74 or 75. <laughs> It was a nice reaction. Obviously, the last time you saw the aeroplane was when it was on its back in Calais. The new engine, new prop, great. Alex's plane has a new temporary home, the former wartime airfield at Goodwood. The visibility is perfect. The wind is straight down the runway here, so that in itself is, is a good thing. It has full dual controls. It really shouldn't be a problem, whichever one of us wants to fly it. 2020 is just weeks away, the 75th anniversary of 1945, and the year that brought peace to the West will be a major event in mainland Europe. You're strapped in, Alex? Yep, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. And finally, a full and free controls. Okay. It's just a, a passion within the person. I mean, you know, Alex loves old aeroplanes. It's a bit like someone who loves old cars. You know, flying a modern aeroplane just doesn't do it for some people. Uh, he'd rather be up there flying by your seat of your pants with a very basic panel. And um, I think there's, there's something nice about owning a bit of history. There's no turning back now. All right. Are you happy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK. Let's Lined go. up on the runway, tail wheel is straight. Slight crosswind, so RPM rising. The aeroplane's flown probably nearly four hours now for the test flying program. So, you know, the only little bugs, not that there were that many, are uh, sorted. Goes down, let the speed build. Perfect, turn slightly into wind. We're pulling 2,000 RPM. It's a lovely day, it's, it's calm. There's not much of a wind, so it was pretty much a textbook takeoff. Yeah, it looked good. Oh, <laughs> it's nice to be back in the area. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> I'm pleased for you. Yeah, Mark did a terrific job. Didn't he? He's done a lovely job, and yeah. it's just such a lovely aeroplane to fly because it just has that that military wartime feel to it, yeah. which is just fantastic. They've gone flying over the Solon. Alex will fly the aeroplane, and then they'll come back and. Hopefully, all's gone well. How does it feel to get your hands on it again? Oh, unbelievable. I've had a really good working relationship with him. He's become a good friend. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's good to see him happy, and it's lovely to see him get up in the aeroplane. Radio vacated taxi to hangar four, please. Okay, I'm going to go back to the plane. It was worth all the money and it was worth waiting for it and I'm happy with it, yeah. Once again, one of the rarest warbirds is on patrol over southern England. Soon, she'll be heading south to the Alps and a new home. A lasting memorial to the pilots who brought peace to Europe 75 years ago.